It is Palm Sunday. Any guesses to what we'll be talking about? Sort of. It's it's in here. Yes. It's in here. Like if you look on your bulletin cover, it's like, oh, that's a Christmas bulletin cover. There's a point to it. Yeah. Christmas leads to here. And the next week it leads, well, of course, Friday, you know, Good Friday when Jesus died for us. Next Sunday when he, when he rose. It, 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 it's all tied together. It, it's nice to, it's like, I love Christmas. It's great. It's like... I love it. Christmas is great. If you know me, oh, it's Christmas. Yay! So you love Christmas. I do. <laughs> it's my favorite time of the year. I like to decorate. Yeah. My wife may take it or leave it. She puts up with it because... Christmas part, the decoration. Yeah, the decoration part. She loves Christmas, too. But it's nice to have, oh, the baby in the manger, and oh, it's, you know, it's safe. But Jesus grows up, and... Leads them to here. And next week, of course, is the biggest day of the year, but we have to have Palm Sunday before we can get to Friday, before we can get to the next Sunday. If you've if you've been w- with us the past well, since we've been, since I've been here, when it when it gets to Palm Sunday, I preach on choices, it seems. I was I went back and looked at what did I do last year and the year before and the year before that? Seems to do with choices. And it's like, why change, right? So it's choices again today, but it's, it's, it's been a little different. The first year, we looked at the difference between the woman that anointed Jesus. Now she had the alabaster jar. And then how the disciples, especially Judas, you know, behaved. She did a wonderful thing by worshiping. This is such a horrible use of waste. So then, like, do we give our best or do we complain about, you know, what other people are doing? The second year, we looked at the crowds. No, on Palm Sunday, we'll read again here shortly, too. The crowd was excited. Yay, Hosanna, Hosanna. But then by Friday, they turn on him, crucify him. Which crowd would we want to be in? Then last year, we looked at the different views that people have about who Jesus is. The one that scripture teaches or the one that the world has made up about him. He's not real. He's just a good teacher. It's good if you follow him. So we have to follow the the true Jesus. All four Gospels, in Matthew chapter 21, in Mark chapter 11, in Luke chapter 19, in John chapter 12, all four Gospels contain this account. In what I will read, I have merged Matthew and Luke together. So you can choose if you want to look at Matthew 21 or Luke chapter 19. They're virtually the same. There's a little bit difference toward the end, which I was say. I think I, I said this for two. No, it, it's recorded. If you want to go back later and go, I will. I will read Matthew now, and then this afternoon I'll go back and I'll rewatch it and I'll read. I read along with Luke. That's okay too. But Matthew and Luke are pretty, pretty identical. But here's the Jesus' triumphal entry. Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it that no one has ever ridden. Untie them and bring them here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that donkey and colt? Just say, the Lord needs them. and He will immediately let you have them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, 
Tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So the two disciples went ahead and did what Jesus commanded. And sure enough, as they were untying the animals, the owners asked, Why are you doing that? And the disciples simply replied, The Lord needs them. So they brought them to Jesus and threw their garments over the colt for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and praise and glory to God in the highest. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. Jesus replied, If they kept quiet, the stones would burst out. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So that's Matthew and Luke's merged together. But they're pretty much the same. Of course, my hope this morning is to bring out that there really are just two choices when it comes to what a person does with Jesus. And to look back at his birth and look forward to his return to hopefully make that point all the more clear. Simply put, you either accept Jesus or you reject him, right? There really is no, there really is no middle ground. We cannot be lukewarm with Jesus. We can't try to, I'll have a little bit of the world and I'm going to have a little bit of Jesus. I want some of this and some of that. We can't have both. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3, verse 16, that the lukewarm he will spit or spew or vomit out of his mouth. Whichever version, whatever word your version uses, so I think the, the spew and the vomit is more, drives the point home. You're gone. We can't be lukewarm. We have to be, we have to be 100% bought in to Jesus. A person either believes in Jesus, accepts him, serves him, and builds their life around him, or they reject him, they ignore him, they don't tell others about him. He's not their Lord, even if they try to keep him as we said before, the fire insurance doesn't exist. I want just enough Jesus where I can avoid hell. It doesn't really work. If that's our mindset, I just want to, how much Jesus can I have to not burn forever? Our mindset is wrong, our heart is wrong if that's what we're trying to do. I want I want, to, I want to live like the world, but I still want to go to heaven. Well, we as believers know there's only one way to get that, and that's being saved and serving the Lord Jesus. The crowd here is praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. We can think about our own life. Have we not seen God's hand in our own lives? <coughs> Has He saved you from things? Has He brought you through things that otherwise like, I have no idea how I'm going to make it through this. God, how did I survive that? God, how am I going to make ends meet this month? God, he has been there. And when we're believers, we can look back on our life and go, oh, yeah, I, I can see God's hand in a lot of things. Unbelievers, they're not looking for it. They don't care. They don't want to see it. Because if I see God, I've got to admit he's, he, he's right and I'm wrong. And who likes to admit that they're wrong? Show of hands, right? And everybody's like, no, no, no. Anybody married? Oh, yeah, no. Hey, don't want to admit you're wrong, right? Sometimes, sometimes we'll joke with, with each other. Can I get that in writing? I was right. We don't want to have to do that. But to be saved, we have to humble ourselves. 
They're worshiping and shouting in the streets. They're heaping blessings on Jesus because He is the one that comes in the name of the Lord. They are excited that Jesus is there, that the Messiah has arrived. Of course, before we've, we've discussed and we can do it like you, their view of what the Messiah would do right then and there is different than what Jesus came to do the first time anyway. We know when He comes back, that's when He's the conquering King. That's when everything is set right. The first time He came to save souls. Regardless, they are praising, they're worshiping, and the Pharisees just couldn't handle that, could they? Don't be worshiping Jesus. Don't be saying these things. They hated it because well, they've been at odds with Jesus since he came on the scene. We're losing power. People are following Jesus and not us. Jesus is teaching things that make us look bad. They can even get to a point here. They're like, teacher, make them hush. We don't like what they're saying. Of course, Jesus doesn't give in to their wishes. He says, they have to do this. If they don't do this, the very rocks would cry out. The rocks would heap praises upon me. Of course, most likely here, Jesus is being proverbial, saying that he is worthy of all praise, be it by humans or by the rest of creation. Who else is due the praise that Jesus, that God is worthy of? Nobody. Psalm 114 speaks of mountains leaping. Can mountains leap? You know, if we have faith, right? The mustard seed, we can make a move, right? It's mountains moving. Isaiah 52 says the mountains and hills will burst into song and that trees will clap. It's interesting. Throughout Psalm 148, the sun, the moon, the stars, the heavens, water, sky, animals, and people all praise their Creator. And Colossians 1.16 says, everything was made for God's glory. So whether Jesus is speaking proverbial and saying, I'm worthy of all praise, how dare you tell people to hush, or you know, all creation, God made it, spoke it into, into existence. It's His. And it speaks of His his greatness. I'm glad God made me. I'm glad I'm here. Humans are made in God's image. It's like the rest of creation is before His glory too, but we're special. We're unique. We're made in God's image, and we definitely should be worshiping. We should be encouraged to praise, to worship, to sing, to shout, instead of being told to hush. We should be vocal about who Jesus is, and what he has done. Of course, sadly, this same crowd here that's praising and worshiping, the king is here, the Messiah is here, yay! As the week goes on, they get silent. They get less and less. Of course, then on Friday, they turn on him. They go from shouting, Hosanna, to crucify him. It's a big turn. The end of the account tells us that the entire city was in an uproar. The entire city was moved. This was a big deal. People had come in to celebrate the Passover. So a lot of people were there. And, and then you, you, you can hear rumblings. You can hear rumors. The Messiah's here. The Messiah's here. The Messiah's coming. Now that would be very exciting. Because people were asking, who is this? Who is this man? Who is Jesus? He's the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And we could probably, probably be safe to bet that you know, stories would have been told about him. Jesus healed this guy. We, I was there when, when, when some guys tore a roof off a building I was in and lowered some guy in on a mat. That's one of my favorite ones. So I mentioned that. I always like that one. The faith of your friends is important. That just Who you hang out with, who your buddies are, that's a big deal. It's like, do I, would, would I have four buddies that would uh, take me to see Jesus? We can't get through the door. What are we going to do? We'll tear the roof off the place. Yeah, stories of what he did. I was there and Jesus made mud and put it on some guy's eyes and he could see again. Stories galore that we could tell about what Scripture says and what we've, what's happened in our own life. 
Jesus did this for me. We have a testimony. We should be vocal about it. Because I could imagine what it would have been like to be there, to welcome in the Messiah. Generations were waiting and waiting. They knew the prophecies. One day the Messiah would come. Could this be him? What excitement. To sing and dance and shout in the street, to tell of the miracles he performed. All your hopeful expectations caught up in one one moment. We're going to be saved. We're going to be free. Hosanna, Hosanna. Because this wasn't the first time the city of Jerusalem was in an uproar because of Jesus. When he was born and the wise men arrived, it happened then too. So yes, and no matter what, we're going to bring in a little bit of Christmas. Matthew chapter 2 tells of the wise men or the magi arriving. The first three verses of Matthew chapter 2 read as follows. It says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is he that's been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone else in Jerusalem. The whole city was disturbed, frightened, concerned with the news they had heard. King of the Jews has been born. If they knew their, their scripture, they knew what this meant. The news of Jesus will bring you to a crossroads in your life. It has to. Remember? We'll speak about the crossroads, fork in your road. And Jeff goes, when you come to a fork in the road, what do you do? You take it. We've, we, we, we've, we've been there before, right? You take it. I can follow Jesus or I can I not. The wise men were searching the skies in the scriptures to find out when Jesus would be born. They were looking. They were searching. The king in Jerusalem... The, the priests, the teachers of religious law, they weren't looking for, for Jesus to be born. It was after the wise men showed up, they were like, hey, hey guys, hey teachers, when's the Messiah to be born? And then, the, you know, then, then they find out, oh yeah, he was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. and They, they weren't active, look, actively looking. The wise men traveled far, and they presented Jesus with very valuable things. The gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. We've, we've read about those before. While well, Herod only wanted to find the baby Jesus to kill him. But the wise men were warned in a dream, don't go back to Herod. Go home some other way. We can either be like the wise men and diligently search the skies in the scriptures to see when Jesus could return. Or motives can be wrong the other way. What can I do to ignore Jesus? How can I reject him? How can I get others to not follow him? Or how can I be faithful? The faithful witness. No, no scripture does speak. There are things that have to happen before Jesus will return. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. And well, we can say, is what's going on in our world that? Maybe. But we have to be prepared regardless. Matthew chapter 25 speaks of ten bridesmaids who were waiting for the groom to a wife. To arrive. Five were wise and five were foolish. Or we look at five were prepared and five were not. Five made the choice to be prepared and to stay prepared. And the others didn't care enough to make the appropriate to make the appropriate precautions, the appropriate preparations. The wise were welcomed into the marriage feast. While the foolish were locked out and they were told, we don't even know who you are. The wise went in, the door was shut and locked behind them. Hey, we're ready now. Go away, I don't know who you are. We're either wise and we're welcomed in or we're foolish and we're kept out. And once Jesus comes back, we can't change that. If he comes back this afternoon, and I think that'd be great, right? You're... 
I've had a good lunch. I've went and I've just woke up from a nap and there's the trumpet and oh, it's over. I'm good to go. Or we, we don't know how long we have. One of the two things will happen to us. We'll be here when Jesus comes back or he'll call us home first. But we have to be ready regardless. Matthew 25 also speaks of three servants that were given various amounts of money when their master went on a long trip. Two servants worked while the master was gone and made an increase in what they were given. These two were told, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will put you in charge of a great many things. Let's celebrate together. Wonderful to hear, right? Well done, good and faithful. That's all my life should be leading for. Is to hear Jesus say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come home, let's celebrate. Nothing else matters. Of course, the other servant didn't do anything with what he was given. He was even too lazy to go down to the bank and deposit it. He did more work by digging a hole and hiding it than it would have took for him to go to a banker. Sometimes we can do more work on things that are unspiritual than it would take us to do things that are spiritual. Don't think, but that's what this guy did. Go to the banker, dig a hole. Go dig a hole. That servant, we were told, was cast out into utter darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, symbolic of eternal punishment. The good and faithful servants go to heaven. The wicked, lazy servant is cast out. The Pharisees, we'll go back to them, back to our triumphal entry account. They did not want people to praise and worship and share about Jesus. Of course not, right? They're the Pharisees. They didn't agree with Jesus. They didn't like what he was teaching. He has taken, you know, the eyes off of them, calling them out for things. So we can be in one of those camps, right? We can share, we can be vocal about what Jesus has done for us, or we can be silent or even worse, try to tell people to hush. Don't talk about Jesus. People don't like that. Of course the world don't like us. When we talk about Jesus, it can convict them. Scripture says not to do certain things. The world does all those certain things, do they not? And it's more and more elaborate and right, right in your face these days. You think back to me when you were a kid or even your, or when your parents were like, things that happened in public or on TV would have never happened you know, a generation ago, would they? It just, it's, it's more out there. But we still are told to expose the deeds of darkness, to shine our light. Even if people don't want to hear it, we still have to share. I have to be faithful to share the truth. You have to be faithful to share the truth. And if people don't like it, still, we put them at their crossroads, right? I have told you the truth about Jesus. It's up to you to decide what you do with him. Because it should be an easy choice, right? Am I going to tell you about Jesus or am I going to just not? Easy choice should it be. I'm going to tell people. Before, during, and after Jesus, Jesus returns, there will be uproar as well, right? We've studied the book of Revelations here. We know a lot of things are going to happen before Jesus comes back. The wars, the famines, the pestilence, the destruction that will take place. Like it'll get way worse before Jesus comes back, and then it's it's all better. Big uproar. We know of the trumpets, the bowls, the destruction. We know that it won't be pleasant for those who must go through it. Of course, we know of a choice that'll have to be made for people then too. Will they take the mark of the beast or will they not? That'll be a choice for people to, to have to make. If if we're here during that time, that'll be a choice for us, right? Am I going to take the mark of the beast or am I going to remain faithful to Jesus? If I remain faithful to Jesus, that could be heavy persecution. I could die for this. It's still a choice to have to make. So you say, oh yes, I will die for Jesus. Are we going to live for him too? 
We have to make that choice. Because we know the end result. Good will triumph over evil. In fact, Jesus has already won that battle. He's defeated sin. He's defeated death. We celebrate that in earnest, in full, next Sunday. Not that we don't every week, but it's, when it's that day, it's all the more poignant. But at that time, everything will be made right. Judgment will be dealt, and nobody will have an excuse. I didn't know. Nobody told me. Church, that was, that was crazy people going there. People, people reading the Bible, ah, I didn't have time for that. Excuses. No one will have an excuse when the Lord comes back. We must be ready. We do not know the day or the hour that Jesus will return. And honestly, we don't know when our time will be up either. Again, one of those two things will happen. The Lord will come back or he'll call me home. So if I'm here, he's with me, right? I got the Spirit. If he calls me home, I'm with him. So I'm good either way. I'm with Jesus here or I'm with him there. We need to be praising and worshiping him because of all the things that Jesus has done. He's done wonderful things. We need to be sharing with people who Jesus is before it's too late. I think I don't know how much time I have. It's like, I don't know how much time family has, friends have, neighbors have. Anyone in here has. We don't know. We need to be all the more urgent in sharing with people what Scripture says, how they can be saved, how they can spend an eternity at peace. Once Jesus returns, it's all over. Will you be prepared? Hopefully he was like, yeah, I'm prepared now, and we've got to stay prepared. Will your choices have been the right ones? Hopefully we say, yeah, my choices will, are leading me to be closer to Jesus. My choices are ha- have me serve him. My choices are having me tell people about him. Hopefully our choices are the right ones. Will you be a sheep that is rewarded for your faith? the ones that took care of the least of these, or a goat that is punished for not believing and serving Jesus. Remember, when Jesus comes back, that's what he'll do. He'll separate, he'll separate the sheep from the goats. The sheep are saved, the goats are not. Choose wisely every day that the good Lord gives you life here on earth. Choose wisely.